Today we're going to take a look at different types and purposes of graphs. And while the graphs that we're taking a look at are different, they do share similar characteristics. For example, every graph will have a title that lets us know what it's going to be about. Graphs are made from two axes. We have the x-axis here that runs left to right, and we have a vertical axis from standing tall right here that is our y-axis. Each axis usually comes with an additional title that just lets us know what the words that we're seeing here or the numbers that we see here are telling us. For, so Isaac, Olivia, Haley, and Paul, these are students that were surveyed. Over here, what does the one mean? Well, it's the number of pets that these children might have. Another part of the graph that we want to be able to understand and identify is called the scale. The scale here on my y-axis is going to be my smallest number, 0, up to my greatest number, 5. So I would say that the scale of this graph is 0 to 5. When I'm looking up this y-axis, I see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. How are the numbers changing? Plus 1. And so my interval, the amount of consistent change between the numbers here on this axis, my interval would be 1. We'll take a look at some graphs today that have a different scale and different interval. Now we'll know what we're talking about. Our first graph is, here is a bar graph. This graph is showing the favorite pet, and a bar graph is used for categorical data. That means that when I was asked a survey question, my answer was a word, not a number. So for example, what's my favorite pet? Well, that would be a dog. So I would be included here in this graph. When I look at this graph, it's very easy to compare these different bars and see which pet was the most popular, which one was the least popular pet. And I can do all of that without actually following over to this y-axis to see what number this bar represents, just because I see this bar is taller than that one. Now let's take a look at this scale over here on my y-axis. I have a scale of 0 to 14, and this time my interval is Two, since my numbers counted 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. Now, when I start to pay more close attention to this graph and I'm looking at bird, now I want to know how many students actually selected bird for their answer. Well, when I look at how tall it is and I follow this height over here to my y-axis, it's between 2 and 4. Well, what number comes between 2 and 4? That's 3. So it means three people selected bird as their answer. I can follow each of these over to ex see exactly how many students selected the answer. But bar graphs are great for being able to look at and quickly see which answer was more popular than another. Line graphs show changes in the data over time. So here I have a graph of some daily high temperatures and by following the line we can see that from Sunday to Monday the high was higher than the day before. We can follow this line all the way across and see the temperatures for each of these days here on my x-axis and it tells me that these are days of the week. Over here when I'm looking at the numbers it tells me that they're a temperature which I knew it was going to be from the title but it is telling me that it was measured in degrees Fahrenheit. And so when I'm looking at this, I can see a trend. A trend is a general pattern of what's happening here in the data. And when I look at the temperature starting here on Monday, you see that every day the temperature got higher and higher and higher and higher until Thursday. And then the temperature started to cool off, even if it's just a little bit. So the trend of the temperatures this week were the temperature was rising until Thursday, and then the temperature started to cool down on Friday and Saturday. The range of the temperatures, we're going to find that by finding the difference of the greatest and least data points. So when I'm looking here, I see that this point is the highest. Now when, as I'm following it over to my y-axis, my interval this time is 10. And so this looks like it's slightly above center. And so I'm going to estimate that this temperature is about 66 or 67 degrees. Then I would have to find my least temperature, which is down here at 50 degrees. And so to find the range on this graph, I would take my greatest temperature minus my least temperature, and that would be the range of temperatures that were here on this week. Our next 
graph is a line plot, and it compares numerical data. If I ask you how many siblings, brothers or sisters, do you have, you would give me a number, numerical, answer. And then I can take this data and I can plot it, that's what they call by placing an X. The X represents someone's answer. And so these zero through six, you notice here that it only has a Y axis, not Y, excuse me, X. It only has an X axis, and the numbers this time are 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 6, and so my interval is 1, and my range is 0 to 6. Not my range, my scale. My scale is 0 to 6. Now as I'm looking at this, you notice that these x's stack up on top of one another depending upon the frequency of their answer. How often someone said, oh, I have no siblings. How often someone answered that they had one sibling, and so on. And so I can tell that the majority or the most popular answer here, the answer given the most often, was two siblings. Now that makes this my mode. Mode is the data that appears the most often. And if you notice, I put a box here around MO and mode because MO reminds me of most often. And just like a bar graph, I can tell that this was the most, or the answer given the most often because this bar stacks the highest. Now let's say that I was going to add an X to this graph. This is a graph that you have to be very careful when you're making because if someone else tells me that they have three siblings, if I come over and place an X for that person's response and I make it this big, then it's misleading when I look at it. It looks like three siblings is tied here with one sibling when in fact that's not true. I just made this X way too big. So it's important when we're making this type of graph, or whoever's making this type of graph, needs to make it in a consistent way. The last type of graph that we're going to talk about is a circle graph. It's also known as a pie chart because it looks similar to a pie that you might eat for dessert. And this one shows how parts of the data relate to the whole set of data. So right here I have a circle representing a monthly budget, the amount of money that maybe a family spends on different things. And you see that half of the circle is taken up for bills, keeping the lights on, paying for the house, things like that. A piece, a wedge, they're called, uh, is for clothes, for recreation, fun stuff and then food, everybody's gotta eat, okay? And so when we look at the different parts, we can see that obviously bills is the biggest space, so it takes up the most of the money for this family. Food would be the next largest. And if I'm looking at this, we can think about fractions, and we'll talk more about that later this year. But I see that this is, if I had equal size pieces of this size in this circle, then this would be one fourth of the budget. And so if I know how much money the family is using in all, or how much of this budget is worth, let's say $100 since that's simple, then I would know that $50 is going to bills or $25 is going to pay for food. Now, most households have a budget that's way more than $100, but we're using that just for illustration purposes so we understand not only what we see, but what it means to us. In your math journal, I would like for you to answer these four questions. Which graph, out of the ones that we talked about today, which graph would be the best choice to do each of these things? You're going to use every graph that we talked about today only once.